So by the time you see this week's video, I will be in Yosemite National Park for my very first visit there, which I'm very, very excited about. And I wanted to wait until I was just about to leave on this landscape photography trip to make this video, just so it's more of a real life scenario. And the reason I, I throw up air quotes around landscape photography trip is because it's not a landscape photography trip. This is a family vacation. I'm taking my kids there for a, a summer vacation. And of course, while I'm there, I want to be able to capture some amazing photos as well. And I think that's a common theme. I think a lot of people don't go on 100% dedicated photography trips. I think most of the time, it's usually a family vacation. Or of course, while you're in these amazing places, you want to um, capture some great photos, but you don't want to take away from family time. And that's kind of the struggle I think a lot of people are faced with. I hear about it all the time and I've been in the situation and I'm about to be in the situation again. And that's the topic of this week's video is to discuss five simple tips to better prepare for your next landscape photography trip. And I prepare for these types of trips, family slash photography trips, quite differently than a dedicated photography trip because I feel like I have to be a little bit more organized and a little bit better prepared because the amount of time I have allocated for photography is greatly reduced as opposed to a trip that's 100% dedicated to photography work. So to jump right into it, the very first thing that I always do is, um, you know, once you have your location determined, you know, I'm going to Yosemite, you got to figure out exactly what you want to shoot. What are the locations you want to shoot? And I usually try and come up with a list of 10. Now, of course, that depends on how long you're going to be at your location, but uh, I always try and come up with more places than I can actually shoot. That way I can actually whittle it down to my number one top favorite must have locations, I should say, and then move on from there. So what I usually do is just hop over here to Google, just type in some type of uh, variation of, um, you know, I put, put in top photo locations in Yosemite just to try and pull up some information about it. And as you can see, there, there's a lot of great stuff here. There's always a ton of articles. This one was re really good right here. Top 10 places to get the shot. And then what I do is I always just kind of just read about them, look at photographs. There's always good information for the most part about the specific location, maybe the best time to shoot it. And there's usually pictures about it. And just go throughout this research process to try and narrow down exactly what I want to shoot. And it really doesn't matter where you're going. You can, there's, there is an article or information on the web about landscape photography in whatever area you're going to, no matter, it really doesn't matter where you're going, you'll be able to find something about it. And this is just a great first step to just go ahead and list out the areas that you want to photograph. And then that way, once you have all that established, you kind of have your, your menu of locations set. Then the very next step that I always go through is hop over to 500 PX. That way I can start to just look through different photographs and see exactly what the specific composition or specific location looks like under different types of weather conditions, edited different ways, just to get a better idea of what can be done at this location. So for this, let's just type in, uh, oh, I actually already have it here, tunnel view, which is probably the most iconic shot in all of Yosemite. And as you can see, you probably recognize it right here, but I always like to go through these just to get an idea of what other people have done, what can be done, what the area looks like in different weather conditions. You know, you got a rainbow here. You can see what it looks like in black and white. Some of these shots are shot more uh, zoomed in. Some are definitely more wide angle shots. Some are panoramas. Some are in harsher light. Some have a nice golden light. But this is just a great way to get a good idea of what you can expect from this location when you actually get there. Now, what I'm trying to do in this step is trying to figure out what I want to do there because I'm, I'm looking at what everyone else has done and maybe I want to get that wide angle shot. But what I find is a lot of the images I've seen in Yosemite as I've gone through this process, everything seems to be, not everything, but a lot of the shots are wide angle shots, which isn't a surprise. It's a very grandiose park. And I kind of want to do something a little bit different where I get more intimate kind of telephoto shots. So it's kind of the, the thinking I'm, I'm going with right now. But I think 500 PX is just a great place to start to just try and get those creative juices flowing. This is an amazing photo right here to get an idea of what you want to do at your particular location. Now, the third step or the third tip that I always go through is to figure out my gear. So I know the locations I want to shoot. I know I now have a better idea of how I want to shoot these locations. Now I want to make sure that I have the gear in place to create the images that I kind of have in my mind. 
So I always start with my cameras first, and, and of course I only own two, oh, two, I only own two. So I'm bringing my Sony and my Fuji XT3 that I'm shooting or I'm recording on right now. And I only own one lens for my Fuji, which is the 10 to 24. So I'm going to bring that as well. And I'm going to bring my Sony 16 to 35. And I mentioned a moment ago that I definitely want to try and get a lot of a uh, telephoto, more intimate images of Yosemite. So I actually got a new purchase recently, which is this. This is the, uh, the Sony G Master 100 to 400, which I'm super excited about. I've heard amazing things about this lens. I've never used it before. And I sold my 70 to 200 and my 55 millimeter prime to make room for this, which I'm very, very excited to test this out there. And I also rented this. This is the, uh, the teleconverter that goes on, the, uh, on this guy right here. So that will give me some serious reach to, uh, to try and get a little bit creative in Yosemite. So definitely looking forward to, to uh, testing it out and seeing what I can come away from with this guy here. But then the more basic things, you know, make sure your tripod and make sure you have um, your ball head, make sure everything's working properly, any kind of filter system you might want to use, backup stuff. So make sure you have your backup solution ready. So however you back up your, uh, your images, make sure you bring that, any kind of uh, cords that are associated with your backup drives. Um, light, because more than likely you'll, you'll be in a situation where you need some type of uh, light, whether it's a headlamp or just a handheld flashlight. Batteries, batteries for both your cameras, one camera, whatever the case may be. You want to make check those, make sure you have the battery chargers for those. Uh, what else? Um, SD cards. This is something I kind of always forget. I always get in situations where I get to a trip or get on a trip and I have images on my SD cards because I forgot to clear them out. So that's a, a good thing to try and remember because the last thing you want to do is be on location, have no room on your cards and have to end up starting to delete images via your camera and that's never really a good situation i always try to not delete images from my camera i always try and delete them from the sd card on my computer but uh, just making sure that you have the gear with you make sure everything's clean ready to go oh make sure you have things to clean your uh, your gear with lens wipes rocket blower cleaning solution whatever the case may be and then the, the second kind of caveat to this is make sure that you practice whatever you're using. So uh, I took this, my new lens out in my backyard the other day and just kind of fiddled around with it, put it through on the teleconverter just to make sure I was a little bit more familiar with it because when you're on location, that's not the time to, to try and figure anything out. If there's any kind of new settings or maybe a time-lapse feature you're trying to figure out on your camera, definitely try and test that out at home before you get on location, before you start kind of fiddling around with that while um, you're in a, you know, a real life scenario. So the fourth step, that I always go through after I've you know confirmed my gear and I know I have everything ready is to hop over to Google Earth, which is an absolutely tremendous tool. And as you can see right here, I already have it set up. This is the area right here that I'm going to be going to. This is the uh, it's called uh, the Tunnel View Overlook, I believe. You can zoom all the way in here get pretty close. So I know that from my research that this is pretty much where you're going to be lined up right here to take the shot. And then if you just come up here, we can just lift this up and you'll be able to see tunnel view. It's El Capitan on the left. You can see Half Dome out here on the right, the Cathedral Rocks. You can zoom out a little bit. And it's just an amazing tool to get really, really close into, let me go back here. Let me zoom in here to exactly what you want to do. And what's cool is you can click on these 360 buttons. You can zoom all the way in here. I mean, look how, <laughs> it's pretty cool how close you can get. There's some a photographer right there, but this is just a great way to get very, very comfortable with the area that you're going to and what you can expect while you're there. So, and then the other part of this is to also prepare, you know, once you, once you scout the location, and I do this for every one of my locations that I'm going to, just so I can feel it out, that way when I'm on location, I feel a little bit more comfortable that I've, even though I've never been there before, but I've researched it all online and I know what to expect. And you also want to map out, yeah, I guess map out, you want to know how long it's going to take for you to get to each one of your locations from your hotel or your campsite or wherever you're staying and make sure that you have plenty of time to get to your location, uh, you know, account for traffic maybe, whatever the case is, you just wanna make sure that you're not sitting in traffic or sitting in your car when the good light's happening during sunrise or sunset. 
going to make sure you, you provide yourself ample time to get to your locations ahead of schedule. So that's all mapped out as well. Now, the final thing that I always do is uh, check the, uh, the light and the weather. And there's multiple different ways to do this. Let me get my phone here and start a uh, screen record. I use uh, two apps for, uh, for light. I use the um, uh, light, or I'm sorry, photo pills and light track for this. For photo pills is um, definitely more robust than light track. Light track is a little bit more basic, but I actually find myself using light track a little bit more often just because it's, it's really easy to just move in and out and just figure out the little bit of information that I need because at the end of the day, really all I'm looking for is trying to determine if a location is a sunset location or a sunrise location. Some locations are both, but usually spots are, location spots are either better at sunrise or sunset, or most of the time it's one or the other. And for tunnel view right here, what I am trying to do, and I have the pin dropped right there on tunnel view, is if I could just kind of rotate this around, this is where the, uh, the sun is rising right here, and then this is where the sun is gonna be setting right here. And I can see that it's setting at almost nine o'clock down here in the bottom, and then it is rising right around, geez, summertime, <laughs> right around 6 a.m. So that just gives me a better idea of how to prepare. And since the sun rises kind of across, it looks like El Capitan, that area. So I guess this could go either way. Sunset is probably the situation where you're gonna get the most direct sunlight on tunnel view as opposed to a sunrise but uh, this just kind of gives me a better idea of exactly what to expect in the sunset and sunrise times and where the sun's gonna rise and set. Now, the other app that I use is Light Track. And very similar scenario, this gives you the ability to kind of move a slider back and forth to determine exactly where the sun rises or sets. And of course, you pick the date or time that you're gonna be there, and this is where it's gonna be rising, this is where it's gonna be setting. So. Very similar functionality as to um, as to photo pills, just a little bit more basic. But the ultimate goal there with the light is just to determine when's the sun going to rise, when's the sun going to set, and where's it going to rise, and where's it's going to set in relation to your locations. And what I do is when I have my list of locations, and once I've done this step, I actually write down on my list if a specific location is a sunrise location, a sunset location, or both is to be a little bit more organized because the very next step here was, is actually the weather component to this step is going to kind of dictate when you go to certain spots. So what I use is Clear Outside, and I've talked about this app quite a few times on this channel before, but it's an amazing app to determine the likelihood of cloud layers, particular le levels of uh, cloud cover, high clouds, medium clouds, and low clouds. High clouds is really what you want. That's what's going to catch the uh, the morning light or the uh, or the setting sun. That's when you kind of get those real explosive sunrises and sunsets. So you want to look for the majority high clouds, maybe a little bit of medium clouds, but <clears throat> ultimately not a lot of low, medium, and high clouds. And I already have this set for Yosemite National Park, which you can see at the top. And once I get within, say, five days of my trip, I can kind of start looking around here. And if you see like zeros, all the way through here, that means there's no cloud cover. And see where it says sunlight, this is kind of the area where the sun is setting right here. And then this right here is where the sun is rising. And the total cloud, low cloud, medium cloud, and high cloud are all zero. So that's gonna be a crystal blue sky. But if we get over to, let me find some time where there's some cloud cover. So this right here, here's a sunset time where there's 10% medium clouds. So it's not a whole lot of cloud cover, but ultimately you're just looking to figure out where the likelihood of having a good sunrise or sunset is. And if you have a particular location that is dependent on having a good sunrise or a good sunset, and you notice on your Clear Outside app that tomorrow morning should be a very good sunrise, maybe you want to go to that specific location during that time frame, or maybe you see that tomorrow's sunset is going to be very cloudy. There's not going to be a whole lot of light. Maybe you'll save that time for a location that's not sky dependent. Maybe that's the location that I'll use my telephoto lens and there won't be any sky. So it really doesn't matter if there's any color in the sky. So what I'll always do is I don't figure out exactly where I'm going on each individual day until I get within about 
two or three days of the actual, you know, going to those locations. And then I start to kind of figure out where I'm going to go. But I usually will map out, say, you know, on, on this day, I'm going to do a sunrise shoot and a sunset shoot. And on this day, I might only do a sunset. And on this day, maybe only a sunrise. And then as I get closer, figure out exactly where I want to go, just depending on the overall cloud cover. So those are the tips that I always go through when, um, or the steps I always go through when I'm planning a trip. It's, it is pretty similar to a dedicated landscape photography trip, but when it's a family vacation first, try and get a, actually a little bit more organized just so I feel like a little bit more prepared when I go on those trips just to maximize my time there. And of course, not take away from any kind of family time. So I hope you are able to get a little bit of useful information out of that video, hopefully a couple of tips that you can apply to your next uh, landscape photography trip moving forward. And uh, if you have any questions, definitely leave them in the comments section below, and I guarantee I will get back in touch with you. And if you enjoyed this week's video, if you could give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed at already. And as always, I really appreciate you watching this week's video, and I'll see you next week. Bye.